So I'm with Saida Vasi, a member of the House of Lords. Saida, tell me, what do you think is the impact of the coronavirus on the Muslim community here in the UK? I think there's been a, a real mix of uh, emotions as to how the community has dealt with it. I think the initial sense of, uh, is this happening? Is this real? Uh, how serious is it? Uh, and then the impact on people's everyday lives. You know, are we going to be allowed to go to the mosque? What does that mean in terms of my work? Uh, how do I mix with family? Um, and I think there were a lot of... Um, lots of unanswered questions early on and I think the challenge for lots of people like me in public life was to try and navigate um, our way through that and provide some sort of direction. I mean the number of phone calls that myself and other parliamentarians for example were receiving in that first week or so when the government started talking about this um, and then, of course, we had the coronavirus bill, which dealt with issues around burials and uh, challenges around places of worship. Uh, I think we were quite shocked as to how much people were looking towards those of us in public life to kind of set some sort of direction and show some sort of leadership, uh, which in a way for me was was quite surprising because it, it, to navigate this space between uh, religious leadership and political leadership was quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting kind of experience in those early weeks. Because there are tensions. I mean, it's the first time in 800 years that the churches have been closed in this country. Um, and there was resistance within the Jewish community in some quarters to the closing of synagogues and services. Purim was around that time. And similarly, there was resistance also, wasn't there, within uh, some, some parts of the Muslim community about closing the mosque? Of course there were. And those conversations that I had with some of the mosque committees and religious leaders were difficult because you, you were effectively, they were arguing from a theological perspective about how places of worship should remain open, how at times of anxiety, the mosque needs to be an integral part of community, how people need to have a place to come and worship and, and you know, soul seek and seek comfort. And yet we were telling them exactly the opposite. So we, we were almost kind of arguing in different ways. And I remember this uh, conversation with one religious leader who said, you have to understand, we also are like the ICU uh, for people's faith and souls. And to try and explain how I understood the sentiment of that, but the practical application of that meant that actually there would be more people in the real ICU and how that would impact on communities was were, were difficult conversations. And, you know, I, I remember in that first week, I was calling people around the world, not actually just in the UK, because certain mosques uh, committee members were overseas, uh, certain mosque committee members were affiliated to other mosque committees around the world. So we almost needed to get agreement across the board and, and we had, an, we had a, an incident you know in our local town where of the five mosques four were prepared to close but one wasn't and so that then had an impact on the way in which the other mosque committees would start to kind of respond so yeah there was some, there were some difficult negotiations in those early days but we've got there and the mosques are closed as are other they are. so one of the questions i've got for you is the impact that's having uh, for the muslim communities and in particular with the sort of bringing into the home, the, the, the religion, the, the religion um, does that provide an opportunity particularly for women, for Muslim women to kind of rebalance their, their place in, in, in practice here in this, uh, in this country? So I think the way that we've seen it, probably I've seen it most personally, is, is through uh, my dad, because he does attend the mosque five times a day. And, uh, and to try to talk to him and, and to understand how he felt. I think he's now slowly coming to terms with the fact that he prays at home. But I think in those early days, I think he felt that a part of him had just been cut out almost. And, um, and so I think certainly for the, the elder members of the community, certainly for the male members of the community who are more likely to go to the mosque five times a day, there was a much bigger sense of loss. Uh, I think for women, probably, you know, what, what I've sensed my mom's gained in all of this is not so much, you know, some sort of parity in the way that they pray, but I think a much bigger sense of family, uh, because these important moments of prayer 
and now done as a family uh, rather than in as you know my dad going off and praying somewhere else and my mom having to pay somewhere else well that's interesting so it's like a strengthening of the family unit and does it also have an implication for understanding of community because you know we can be connected now and muslims not just muslims but jews christians hindus and sikhs and others are now connected nationally and internationally in a way that they weren't um a few months ago they are and, and i think i suppose it very much depends on the the kind of life you led before so it may shock you to say that I've probably seen through calls like this more of my family and friends than I would do in a normal week because I'm traveling and I'm away from home. And I think suddenly being at home and suddenly understanding that everybody else is at home and in many ways almost available all the time to take a call in the way that we're not when we're going about our everyday lives. I think that has connected families, it's connected communities, connected friends and it's invariably connected faith communities and in terms of culture and religion what are the what's the potential ongoing implications um i think a lot of people you know whether you're of faith or or non and whichever faith you come from have been doing a lot of soul seeking i think a moment of quiet allows us to think about who we are and why we're here and what are we doing and are we doing enough and could we do things differently? And, uh, you know, that I've had friends who have had conversations about career changes. Um, I've had friends who see the way in which they want to live their life very differently. Um, I've had, you know, siblings starting to talk about retirement. Um, you know, I think it's affected people in, in very, very different ways. I think people have suddenly realized that, uh, certainly the, the experience that I've had is that people, the, we all believe that the world will not go on really if we're not doing what we are doing every single day and it's all essential work. And, uh, you know, my, uh, 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 a lady who works in my office suddenly said, well, the world does go on, doesn't it, Saida? Uh, even without all these urgent appointments that need to go into your diary every single day, the world does go on. And I think that was a moment for, and she said, and I hope that this will allow you to have a much more healthier approach to diary once this is over, because it doesn't all have to happen and it doesn't all have to be done by you and it doesn't all have to happen now. Yes, it's quite salutary, isn't it, to realise we're maybe not quite as important as, you know, uh, we like to think we are. And, and, and uh, there are plenty of parliamentarians for whom that would, be, that would be quite important, I should think. But that's true in my own uh, academic community as well. It's, 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 it's true of all of us. Um, so but I think we also beat ourselves up, don't we? I think we spend a lot of time just constantly thinking about how you know we have to do this and it, a lot of it is guilt you know you have to do every appointment you have to make every commitment you have to attend all these things and then suddenly you sit back and you think well actually there's a there's another way of doing this and you can carry on doing a lot of the good work that you do without really racing around and charging around all the time i think that's right and i think it also gives us a different sense of time as well because yeah are, has changed now that we're all at home. What's it done for you? Um, I think for me, it's been quite a mixed experience. So I'm, uh, I'm physically not charging around, but I'm still as busy as, as I probably was in those early days. I think there's, uh, I mean, I'm obviously I have a, a real world. I have, uh, I'm involved with a number of businesses and, and uh, a number of them have been involved in key work, so key supply. And so we've had to balance, um, you know, workforces, making sure we keep things running, making sure we keep, you know, we, we watch the health of our workforce and all of that has had to be managed from, from, a, from afar for most of it. Um, and then on top of that, you've got the casework has just exploded. So every day, dealing with quite sad cases, really, people calling up to make sure they could try and get some access for end of life for people who have parents say in hospitals with COVID, issues around uh, deaths and death certificates, issues around burials. Funerals are large community events within the Muslim community and invariably you can have hundreds and thousands indeed attend funerals uh, and it's, it's you know the, the, the saying within the Muslim community is if you get invited to a wedding it's okay if you don't turn up but even if you don't get an invite you must all turn up to a funeral. 
you know, and it's that sense that it's a big part of what the community does. You know, it's, it says it's goodbye. And now with the number of people being restricted at funerals from to six or eight or 10, I think the guidance has been different in different spaces. Uh, that's been really difficult because that means even your nearest and dearest, your closest family and, and siblings and children can't attend. And so one of the things that I saw, which I thought was beautiful, was that um, uh, an amazing uh, community uh, guy from, uh, from West Yorkshire passed away not so long ago. And uh, the way they dealt with him was that they, uh, that as he, as they drove to the, to the, uh, to the graveyard, they, they drove through all the kind of local streets and people just came out onto the road. Everybody was socially distancing, but just came out to the front of their gardens uh, and just, uh, just, you know, stood in silence. And it was a really, really moving moment of, of being allowed to pay your respects uh, during these difficult times in an alternative way. And my final question is, do you think that's something that's going to stay with us, this realisation of the need for community, the need for supporting one another? There, there, there seems to be a, a greater sense of what the neighbourhood is today. Um, is that something that will stay with us? I would sincerely hope so. But I, I think I also hope that what we've also learned is who really makes the world carry on. I think we've realized who, who are key workers, you know, who are the people that we genuinely depend on? Um, what are the real necessary jobs? Uh, where should the value in society uh, be placed? Um, and I think, you know, if we, if we look back and we say, actually during this period, I was able to stay at home and to work from home. I think that should say to us, I'm probably not as important as I think I am. But if during this period, I still had to go out and I had to work because I was providing a necessary and key element for survival, which is what this period was about for a lot of people, then they are the people that genuinely society should value and needs uh, above so many others of us um, and I think I hope that stays with us a kind of realigning of value in society because I think often we have lost um, you know a, a sense of reality really as to where value lies in humanity and human beings and what they do in terms of enriching other people's lives. Saeed Devasi thank you very much. <laughs>